Welcome, everyone. My name is Margaret Okadashek. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions here at Harvard Divinity School. I hope you've had a really robust uh, sort of morning and early afternoon with all of the different programming and open office hours that we have provided um, throughout your time. And now it's I'm just really incredibly excited to be able to speak with our incredible HDS alumni. So um, I'm joined today with um, uh, four phenomenal alumni um, who I'm excited for you to, to hear about their journeys and perspectives um, and their experiences. So um, let's see. I think we're missing one person, but I think we should get started. So I'm going to um, just sort of call out the different panelists um, first and then um, ask if you can introduce yourself um, and uh, where you're geographically located right now. Okay, so um, Ferris, would you mind getting us started, please? Yes, for sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ferris Blunt, uh, pronouns are he, him, his. I am located in Memphis, Tennessee uh, this afternoon. So good to be with you all this afternoon. Thanks so much. Gary, would you mind uh, sharing where your, uh, your name, where you're calling in from? Sure. Uh, my name is Gary Brin. Um, I also have he, him, his pronouns. And I am here today from Elmira, New York. Wonderful. Um, uh, Afroza? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Afroza Hussein. My parents are she and they, and I am located in Philadelphia. Fantastic. Elizabeth? Greetings to everyone. I am Elizabeth Siwo Kondi, and it is a pleasure to join you. And I would like to just thank the admissions team, other panelists, and also prospective students for joining us today and uh, I'm a bit in transition at the moment so location uh, to be disclosed. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful and Felipe thank you so much for joining us. Would you mind sharing your name and where you're geographically located? Hello everyone my name is uh, Felipe Agredano and uh, I am from El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora Reina de Los Angeles de Porciancula or just LA. Is that Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go just around um, and ask just a few questions. And then there will be time um, after after we answer these questions um, for um, questions from the audience. So the first thing, and I'm going to call on different folks first. Um, Gary, can you tell us a little bit about your academic and or career pursuits before you attended HDS, like your undergrad and what did you study? What, you, what, did, what was your career before HDS? Sure. Um, I was actually in the tech industry. I was the director of learning for a multimedia company in lower Manhattan on 9-11 um, that had a pretty profound uh, effect on my life, mainly in wanting to do something different. Um, but I had not finished my bachelor's degree at that point, so I went back to school at Hunter College in part of the City University of New York, where I studied a uh, double major in English and in studio art. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of it. So I'm a techie, artist, reader, writer sort of person. Amazing. Ferris? Sure. So I actually came to HDS straight out of undergrad. So I went to undergrad at Stanford out on the best coast in California. <laughs> uh, and I majored in international relations and minded in African African American studies before coming straight to HDS. Amazing. Elizabeth? So for me, I majored in Black Studies as an undergraduate. And actually, the HDS admissions team came. So I can tell you the power of being able to speak with an admissions officer <clears throat> and also just to learn more about the community. But I was majoring in Black Studies, and then I worked in corporate America as well. And after that, went for a Master of Divinity. I took a short break to work in nonprofit and then came to HDS after that. Um, and I'm sorry, 
One of the things I also meant to ask folks, if you could also tell us what degree program you graduated with. I, I realize now that I forgot to ask that. Elizabeth, what degree program did you graduate from? Yes, I completed the Master of Theology. So that's the degree program that typically comes after the Master of Divinity. So it's an advanced degree program and is also considered uh, a terminal degree for those who want to teach or have other pursuits as well. Thank you so much. And Gary, can you share what degree program you completed here? Absolutely. Master of Divinity in uh, 2008. Great. And Ferris? A Master of Divinity as well in 2017. Great. Uh, Afroza? So I graduated with an MTS from um, the Div School in 2014. Before that, I took a little break after I did my undergrad. I did my undergrad also at Hunter College, like Gary. I triple majored. I had started as a double major in physics and biochemistry, switched the physics to religious studies, <laughs> then picked up another third major in classics uh, to study the dead languages, and um, then took a little break, started a company, an educational consulting company that I did for a couple of years before I decided to pursue uh, graduate studies. And then um, I decided why not the Divinity School? And I'm really glad I did. Amazing. And Felipe? What degree program uh, did you complete while here at HDS? And what were your sort of academic and career pursuits before you came to HDS? I I started at the community college um, and I was uh, able to transfer to UC Berkeley uh, where I completed uh, a bachelor's in political science and a bachelor's in ethnic studies with an emphasis in Chicano studies. Um, and I um, applied to the MDiv at Harvard Divinity School, and I got into the program. And I actually switched over to MTS uh, towards the end, towards the end of um, end of my program. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, MTS. But I applied originally for the MDiv. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Felipe, why don't you get us started with the next question? What was your academic focus while at HDS? And if you can remember your area of focus in the MTS program, what what it was it? Hello. Okay. So um, I was really because of my um, undergraduate in political science uh, emphasis on Latin America and also in Chicano studies, um, which I took uh, at people of the Caribbean. Uh, of course, Mesoamerican religions. At HDS, I continue and I kind of carved out my own um, concentration in uh, 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 Latino religions, Latin Americanist, uh, and also I took a, for ex for example for foreign languages I or or uh, other religions I did Mesoamerican religions, which this is before we had David Carrasco at HD HDS. So I took uh, some Mesoamerican uh, classes at archaeology, uh, anthropology, uh, with Professor William Fash. So I looked at the Mayas, the Aztecs, uh, and then and my and I took I took a lot of our courses because they, they, we had visiting scholars in Chicano studies from uh, from UC Santa Barbara and also from um, who taught Chica, Chicana uh, literature, uh, Chica, Chicana novels, and I because there was not Chicano studies concentration at the Divinity School or um, at the Yard, um, I ended up taking lots of courses in African-American studies uh, with Dr. Cornell West, American Democracy, uh, also with Dr. Brooks, Evelyn, uh, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Um, uh, so, so a lot of these courses I was able to create and carve out my own um, emphasis on Latinos and religions, Latinos and spirituality, uh, and religion as a, uh, as a, something for a, a causing revolution. So it, it was it was um, it was a good concentration. I'm really thankful that I did so. I it served me as a strong base uh, in ethnic studies, African American studies, Chicano studies, uh, with the religious and and phenomena, as well at at HDS. Thank you so much. Afroza? 
So my concentration broadly was religion, politics, and public policy. But I joke that I um, concentrated on Michael D. Jackson's classes because I took a course with him every semester. Um, he's an ethnographer. And so I became very invested in the ethnography of religion as it applies through politics. So I took a whole bunch of classes at the Kennedy School, which were really helpful in giving me that um, background. And I took some economics courses with Larry Summers in the yard as well, and some courses in the philosophy department in the yard to round it out. And um, I still think of myself as an ethnographer of religion, though that's not the professional career I have uh, sort of uh, branched out into. I'm not an academic. Um, I think having such a flexible ability to do what I wanted to do at HDS to sort of implement my vision for what my studies would be uh, was really helpful and, and really insightful for what I wanted to pursue academically while I was there. But broadly, it was within religion, politics and public policy. And that can still sum it up, but it is a broad enough topic as anything else that um, you want to study at HDS. Thank you. Elizabeth? Let's see, I working in the, the Master of, of Theology program was a bit different than the Master of Divinity because I already came in with the foundation. I'd had a lot of experience already working in churches, uh, corporate settings, nonprofits. And so that I, I really loved the fact that HDS gave us opportunities to explore different things. And I think you're already hearing that from each of the panelists so far that we were really able to carve our own paths. So for me, it was in African studies because Harvard as a, as a the university as a whole has one of the strongest African studies programs around. And so being able to, to take courses at HDS with uh, Dr. Jacob Olupona and studying uh, African religions and theologies with him, and then also being able to go to uh, the, the larger university and being able to take some, some work and build relationships in African languages because Harvard has one of the strongest African language programs around. <laughs> And so I really just enjoy being able to put those pieces together and say, this is how I want my studies to look like while I'm here. And then also I got a chance to work on what I call the small voice, voices of people who are, are orphans, widows, and immigrants, what the, the Bible has, has, has put together as some of the most vulnerable uh, groups. And so while at HDS, I was able to do that in each of my studies as well as being able to have access to some of the phenomenal libraries that we have. So mine was something that I really carved and every aspect of it built upon something that, that later on we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like what we've done since then, but I was very well prepared. I also want to share that I, I took courses with uh, Dr. Charles Adams uh, in homiletics and he is now deceased, um, rest peacefully, but taking a course with someone who is really an icon in, in homiletics and preaching was absolutely phenomenal because the way that he approached the class is that we were academics, but we were also people who were going to be leaving that academic space and going into the world in different ways. And so I found that to be true for each of the professors that I worked with and I've just named a few but I also had a chance to take courses in pastoral care and counseling. And that's where I learned to do verbatims and that skill has transferred into other areas. So I wanna highlight just being able to have transferable skills uh, from my degree program. So I was there a short time and there are very few people who, who enter the Master of Theology program. And so we were a small community, but we were able to build relationships also with the larger theological uh, school system. Thank you, Elizabeth. Ferris? Yes, I echo just the, the, the ability to ace just to really carve out a path that makes sense for where you feel called to be and do in the world. So at HCS, I had a dual focus. At HCS, I accepted the call to ministry while in school there. I served at a local congregation there. So part of my academic experience was like trying to prepare me for that. So of course, your your your, your Hebrew Bible Testament courses with, with Dr. Teeter, who I believe is still there. Um, I took, but I also used took advantage of across the different schools. So I took a, a nonprofit finance accounting course at the Kennedy School when I was at HDS. I took a leadership course um, around around leadership at the um, business school while I was at HDS. Right, 
Um, so I took advantage of those other other areas. I think the other academic interest area for me was thinking through how can the Christian faith be used for justice and liberation as well. This is like an ethic of mine that really got it cultivated at the Div School. So I took courses with uh, Dr. Dr. Harvey Cox on God and money. Uh, Dr. Breck is thinking through Christianity and capitalism. Um, Dr. Braxton, who was an adjunct when I was there, he taught a class called Preaching, Healing, and Justice. So how do we use preaching for healing and justice in the world? So I really appreciated the ability for HDS to both allow me to branch out and find some of the more practical ministerial tools and gifts I could I could process through, but also I could use my experience to really think through how this one Christian faith intersect with so much of the way we live and move throughout the world. And not just Christian faith, but religion, generally speaking, uh, but and then allowed me to ha kind of have those conversations across politics, around across justice, across different patriots as well, uh, while I was at HDS. Thanks so much, Ferris. And finally, Grin uh, Gary? Sure. Um, so I guess I'm sort of the traditional cookie cutter MDiv, right? Uh, I didn't do really exciting things. I came in as someone who returned to Christianity after years away as a gay man who felt that there was no space for me um, in the Christian tradition and, and being reintroduced to a new way of thinking about Christianity. And so I was really just, I've got to check the boxes to get the United Church of Christ ordination. I need to under, I need to do the biblical scholarship work. I need to understand how to do theology. Um, and what was really exciting for me was really unexpectedly the ways in which I was introduced to constructive theology and historical critical thinking about the Bible. And then they they began to feed each other uh, in a way that that I believe not only makes me um, better as a pastor than I would have ever been as a preacher in particular around uh, exegetical work and homiletics, but I think also really empowered me to be a public theologian, which is a really important role and something I'll talk a little bit more when I talk about what I've done since I graduated. Thanks so much, Gary. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, we, we even today, as in the time when you were uh, pursuing graduate studies, you know, there's a lot of different programs in the world. There's a lot of graduate programs, a lot of graduate programs in religion. Potentially, you might have applied to other schools. Um, can you share with us, why did you choose HDS? Um, and this time, let's start with Afroza. Afroza, would you mind getting us started? Um, no, not a problem. So I only applied to three other programs besides HDS and... Um, when I was looking at it, I was also a newlywed. I had just gotten married the summer before I started at uh, HDS. So it was a practical matter of where could we move that would be um, suitable for both me to pursue a graduate program and for my then partner to be able to find employment. And um, out of all the programs, um, it turned out that Boston <laughs> just worked for us. Um, I had applied to Yale Divinity School and we really liked New Haven, but it just did not um, work out. So uh, in the end, it was HDS and it had a lot to do with what was going on in my personal life. As you know, I think most people understand that you can't isolate one thing from the other. So all aspects of our lives are sort of a gestalt decision making that happens where all these things come together and you choose one thing over the other things that you could choose. So I'm glad I did. Uh, and I really enjoyed my time at HDS. So I have no regrets. We often, as an admissions person, I often say that it is often a family decision if you're more than one person having to make the decision to pursue graduate education. Um, Ferris, would you mind sharing, why did you choose HDS? Absolutely. Um, I definitely echo it being uh, more than one thing that drives the decision. I also, too, applied to three schools, but set on HDS for several reasons. One, born and raised, grew up in a very Christian environment, but I always thought there was something more that as part of my tradition I was not getting at. And it's like being at, at a divinity school at like HDS as opposed to maybe a seminary, right, where Christianity is the main thrust. But divinity school, there's going to be a Christian things and thinking there, but a wide range of traditions that intersect with and in conversation with, I wanted that for, for my graduate school experience, right? Like as someone 
who sees the value of religion, sees the intersections of religion in so many ways we live our lives. I want to be in an, in both a, uh, an ecumenical space, but also a non-Christian space as well, where I was having to engage different ideas that were new to me. Um, and I really had some of, some of the greatest conversations I had was not just in the classroom, but after class, right? Just talking in the hallways of Andover and, and what have you. So that was a big reason why I chose HDS. Um, the BTU, uh, the Boston, thing, I think it was called BTU when I was around, but the ability to take courses across different schools as well was a big draw because we had, we had access to other schools in the Boston area to be talking with other students, other professors. That was a draw as well. And then honestly, too, you know, as a person of faith, it came down to a faith decision, too. It just felt like the place where I was supposed to be for the seasons of my life. Um, and it did pan out in, in many different ways, more than I expected. Uh, but those are the reasons for me why HDS and to um, the financial aid package was really great. It was very great as well. And that that mattered because I didn't go to div school to make a lot of money to be able to come to div school and that and to not have to take out uh, money to do so um, was a very was a blessing as well, too. Thank you, Gary. Sure. I also applied uh, to three schools. Uh, Master Divinity programs was admitted to all three. Uh, all three were good programs. Uh, there were two sort of personal factors. Uh, one, as Ferris has said, the financial aid package was uh, slightly better at HDS. Uh, it wasn't the game changer. Um, my best friend had recently moved to Cambridge, um, actually in walking distance to the campus. So that was certainly appealing to know that I would have some support and some community already built into place. Um, but I think ultimately the decision for me came down to the fact that um, I kind of realized going in that none of the schools were really going to prepare me for the messiness of day-to-day -day life as a pastor. Uh, the, the, you know, I just wasn't going to learn. I was going to learn that practically. I wasn't going to learn that sitting in a classroom. So where could I study with world-renowned scholars who are going to put me a step ahead in terms of the understanding of the theology and the scripture that I needed to work with every day as a pastor? Um, and hands down, there was no, the other two schools were good, but there was no question that I was going to study with the best of the best at HDS. Thank you so much. Elizabeth? I wanted at the time to go to a, a, a PhD program and I applied and that was not the case at the time. And I'd also applied for the, the Master of Theology. And when I was accepted, I actually owe it to one of my siblings who encouraged me and said, you need to go. Right, because I took pause for a moment to say, well, should I just wait another year and continue with it, or trying for a PhD program? And the, the sibling said, you need to go. And he said uh, to me, it's Harvard. <laughs> so I just want to put that out there because it is Harvard, that's why. <laughs> but um, be, be, because it's, it's Harvard, the, the resources, right? There are very few schools that offer, for me, African studies and religion. And Harvard had that. Other schools, they may offer pieces here and there, but as a university as a whole, the resources really are just unmatched. And I wanted a place where academics were going to be at the forefront, where I could actually sit and I could study, I could have those academic conversations. I could be challenged by people who thought differently from, from how I think. And at the same time, I could bring my thoughts to the table in a place where I felt it would be respected. And so that to me was really important. As well, I had a mentor who, who graduated from Harvard some, some years prior. So when I received that card from the admissions office, I held on to it. And then at the right time, it's like, okay, you know, this is now the time. Maybe this is why, uh, for people who believe in God, <laughs> maybe this is why God had me to hold on to this card all these years for such a time as this. <laughs> I'm just here laughing by myself because all these references, perhaps some people are getting it and if you're not, that's all right. You get to come to HDS and you will figure it out from there. Uh, but HDS just really had that, that space where academics were at the forefront. And at the same time, the people were at the forefront, right? I, I was studying at a time where my own country was going through uh, some, some very challenging political times. And the HDA, SDA, HDS community really just rallied around me and was, was very, very uh, supportive. 
And so I, I think that academics are, are really central as well as the people who were there. And again, I just, I'm really grateful that my siblings said to me, you need to go, you know, it's Harvard. <laughs> And so I put that out there uh, to you and, and all the resources that, that were there that we hear about are definitely, definitely there. And I believe in many cases, completely un unmatched. And I've, I have degrees from a lot of different places, but what, what Harvard presented in terms of my interests really came at the perfect, perfect time. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And uh, Felipe? You know what? I, I only applied to one um, school for, mass, for my master's. I only applied to Harvard Divinity School. I considered Union Theological Seminary, uh, but like Elizabeth, um, when a, a very good friend said, you're going to Harvard, just, you know, just knock it off, just <laughs> apply. And uh, I'm really glad and really fortunate that I did. Um, it, it also was a place that um, as, as a, uh, Ferris mentioned the BTU, Boston Theological uh, Union, gave us classes. We traveled, you know, there was like six or seven Latinos we would take the metro to Ants, Andover Theological, uh, Andover, Ants, Andover Newton Theological Seminary, right? Uh, to take uh, 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 Sam Sullivan, a, the a Latino theologian out in Ants. Uh, Harvey Cox brought us uh, uh, Pentecostalism, uh, the Pentecostal Church. And uh, BTI, thank you for me. It was a BTI consortium. BT. Uh, so we had we had a, a exposure. I took I, I, like uh, some of you like uh, a froze. I took classes at the Kennedy School, um, uh, Mexican American Immigration and Policy. Took classes at the law school with Dr. West and uh, Roberto Mungaburia, uh, Roberto Unger, right? And and so. So having that exposure to a number of theological schools, having that exposure to a number of graduate uh, colleges and universities, and within Harvard, there was 11 graduate schools, and you have access to all that. It was just, uh, you know, having your cup filled by a, like a, like a, a hydrogen um, uh, welcoming at you. It was just like two, so many classes, so much exposure, so many world scholars. I also took a class with Dr. Cornell West every semester. He was my graduate uh, advisor. And uh, we used to joke about that. We we majored, like Elizabeth mentioned, we, we majored in Cornell West studies uh, because uh, I took a class with him every single semester, also with uh, Harvey Cox, uh, who was a phenomenal theologian. And just having that exposure was critical, foundational to set me up for the rest of my life. Uh, uh, Harvard Divinity School was an incredible wealth of opportunity, exposure, and I'm so glad I only applied to one and I got into it and I made the best out of it. Thank you so much. This is so wonderful. Um, okay, <clears throat> my last question and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, what have you been up to since graduating? So I think this is actually the biggest question that is on top of many of our prospective students' mind. What do you do with an HDS degree? How, what kinds of careers and pathways does this set you up for? So hearing your alumni stories is so wonderful. What a privilege for us because um, it's really going to get at sort of the ways in which this work translates to um you know, different careers and pathways. So Gary, would you mind starting us off, please? I don't uh, mind at all. So I probably for a long time looked like the most, again, boring sort of cookie cutter. You go get your MDiv and you become a pastor in a local church. Um, so coming out of HDS, I spent a year as the Tannenbaum Fellow for Interreligious Practice at Vassar College. And then I uh, went right into parish ministry and I've served uh, several parishes along the way, um, really uh, leaned into the United Church of Christ passion for social justice. In fact, one of the classes I took um, in the consortium, uh, so not at HDS, but in the consortium, I took a class called Pastoral Care as if Social Justice Mattered. Right, which was an interesting way of, of thinking about it. 
Um, so really doing social justice work, community work as a local church pastor, as a public theologian. Um, three years ago, I was called to a historic pulpit in Elmira, New York, a church founded by abolitionists. I'm in a pulpit that was held by Thomas K. Beecher, um, later by Annis Ford Eastman, a, a woman pastor leading a major congregation at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and I was just going to, I just got here to do, you know, I'm just going to do my pastor thing. I'm just going to get up there and preach and um, lead my congregation. And they're going to go out there and, and kick butt the way good UCC activist congregations do. Um, and we kept running. I have a passion for housing justice. And we kept running into obstacles. Nobody would take our conversation about housing justice seriously. So I did a crazy thing, being almost new to this community. I ran for city council um, and won. Um, and, um, you know, I am the, the lefty Democrat, and I cannot tell you how much time I spend with the conservative Republican mayor as we sit down eating tacos and drinking beers and trying to figure out how we're going to turn this city that has never recovered from a 1972 flood around um, into a thriving new city. Um, in that, and, and this is the part where I kind of hinted at earlier, the skills of being a public theologian, something that I was told I would probably need to be at HDS, but I, I never saw it happening, right? I'm just going to serve my church. Uh, but now I am very much constantly on the, you know, on the local news, speaking at city council about moral issues um, and dealing with everything we deal with in the political space these days. Um, I have the skills to do that because of HDS. Um, so I should be near the winding down part of my career, but there's a whole new second career that's kind of taken off. That's phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing. Elizabeth? I entered HDS with a lot of confidence and I graduated with even more confidence. And I think that that is an important to share because we are some, like when you leave the academic setting, we're not always able still to have some of the conversations that we get to have when we are in the academic space, right? And so I went in with this, this, I, this, this space of, of thinking that I want to be able to take advantage of as much as I can, use every single opportunity that's presented to me. If there is something that is missing, I want to create it. And so I did that. So for me, the question is not really uh, what, what have I done with my education, but more like what have I not done, right? I've been able to do so much and to be able to do so many things. While at HDS, I was the commencement speaker and that was really quite an honor. And my topic was the value of theological education, right? Because we also, we question that. You may be with families right now who are asking you, you're, doing, you're gonna do what in this economy? You wanna go study theology? Oh my dear, why, right? And so that's something that maybe you're even wrestling with, like, why do I wanna do this? And so I spoke about the value of theological education, the way that we approach the world, the way that we learn to listen, the transferable skills that we gain. And so upon graduation, I have been a, a preacher. I continue to be a preacher. I was able to do that while at HDS. On one of the days when the renowned Dr. Charles Adams was not able to preach, uh, he asked the class, who, who would like to preach in my stead? And I said, yes, right? To go and preach for preach in the space of someone where everyone is expecting that big name person, then here comes me, right? And so being able to, to preach that day, that sermon opportunity became a... a uh, it became an article, and then that article translated into something else, translated into something else. So I've, I've continued on with my preaching. Also, I was a pastor. Right? I went on and I took a clinical pastoral education as well. And so the skills that I learned at HDS in terms of being able to write verbatims, I was prepared. When my other classmates had never done a verbatim before, I had already done it. So I showed up at, at, at Dartmouth-Hitchcock 
ready to do the work. And then that also has allowed me to be able to, to write effectively when I'm in meetings in other spaces. So preaching, uh, being a pastor, also being a professor, right? And I earned that PhD that I wanted. I was prepared because of, of what I gained at, at HDS. So for me, the question again is not, uh, what have I done, but what have I not done? And I'm still doing more. I'm still creating spaces and opportunities for myself. And I love that. I love them. And uh, I hope the same for, for you, however you decide and wherever you decide to go, that you take advantage of those opportunities because there is value in theological education. We need people who can listen to all sides. We need people who can think critically. We need people who are willing to read and read a lot instead of just taking sound bites, but to be able to read and to synthesize and to put it out there in ways that are palpable for the general public. And we also need people who are just good, right? Just good people, people who are good to their family members, people who are good to neighbors. And HDS allowed us to be able to do that. How do I talk with people who are different from me? And how do I put my voice into that space as well? So I leave it up to you as well. What is it that you want to do? And I hope that this can be a place for you. Thank you so much. Felipe? Wow. I came to Harvard Divinity School as a, a religious refugee. Um, I grew up Pentecostal. Uh, apostolic Pentecostal, which is, I'm, I'm a modelist. And so uh, there was no space for me in my theological upbringing because I was, sorry if there's a little, it's a little loud here, but I, um, I came, I, I came uh, like, like Gary, I was on my journey of coming out as a gay man and uh, being, and, and Harvard Divinity School provided that space, a, a safe space and a brave space uh both and and uh i was able to we were able to engage in social justice uh even at harvard divinity school um with we we set up a campaign of six seven students to bring uh latino professors latina professors we have david carrascos we have i think up to like three or four professors now since harvard divinity school um i also uh like elizabeth you can see what where were the gaps created a theological space online for LGBTQ, Pentecostal, Apostolic men and women, now trans uh, men and women as well, trans people. So that uh, we're I'm still doing, still engaging. And I'm going to borrow your idea, Gary, uh, Taco Tuesday and theology, and, uh, and have that those conversations, which are very important. Since HDS, I also was covering um, religion in Los Angeles. And so since I'm still doing that, I'm still doing uh, uh, for NBC Telemundo, Univision, um, CNN Espanol, uh, Fox, and a lot of, and I do um, commentaries in Los Angeles on theology. I also continue to be engaged in politics because I was, uh, political science was also my undergraduate. So I created a pack with friends and we've gotten over um, 100 people elected, over uh, 100,000 in money that for Latino, LGBT, or uh, allies that that uh, that support candidates. Uh, it's called Honor Pack. I'm really proud of that. This And I'm still engaged in that. Um, HDS really provided a platform, an avenue to to uh, to be involved, to be engaged, uh, uh, bringing religion to the public sphere and bringing also the public sphere to religion and being that bridge, that connector. Um, it's been an incredible ride. I'm so, like, like Gary, things are just vamping up, uh, still involved in politics and religion and uh, LGBT community, social justice issues. Uh, it's an incredible platform. I'm really glad that that that's been uh, the foundation of, of my start of my theological formation. Thank you so much. Afroza? Um, I have been on, I want to say that, you know, you have your own unique experiences and whatever you study at HDS will only bolster that. Um, I will give an example. I have always been involved in social justice things. I think of myself as an activist. Uh, I graduated from college in 2008 
and a bunch of my friends and um, we started Occupy in downtown New York and it became a national movement, you know, and um, the last couple of years I've been really involved with the reparations. I'm on the mayor's commission in Philadelphia with the reparations um, in my Quaker community. We were the first um, Quaker uh, meeting to allocate half a million dollars for reparations to black uh, homeowners in the neighborhood that our meeting house is located. And that's now become a model for other Quakers. I've been consulting with Quakers in both uh, North America and in, um, in the UK about doing their own reparations. And I'm on also, I was the vice chair of um, the Citizens Police Oversight Commission uh, for Philadelphia, which is the first such commission in the country where we have an independent commission that that has oversight over police misconduct. And that came out out of 2020. Um, some of you may know because it made national news, the Philadelphia PD in um, the wake of George Floyd's murder, tear gassed a bunch of us uh, on the interstate. And I, could, I was blind for two months after that. Um, and it became a big issue. Uh, a bunch of us worked with um, the majority whip of city council to get this legislation passed to form CPOC, which would become its own agency. And then I became the first vice chair for it to, you know, and, and it's, um, it's being led to look at police misconduct that anybody can report without police involvement, which is not the case in other cities in America. Um, the NYPD has such a thing, but NYPD and its union also has people sitting on that oversight commission. And all of this comes out of my own personal you know, life experiences. I grew up in New York City. I was 14 years old when 9-11 happened. So I grew up as a Muslim immigrant person in a police state, because that's what the NYPD had turned New York City into post 9-11. And that really informed my political consciousness. You know, it, it formed who I would become and what kind of things I would uh, champion. And I think my time at HDS only bolstered that and my uh, experiences in life, which like led to a lot of things. Like right now, I'm really involved with reparations and um, I, in my professional life, also do DEIB. I've um, done some consulting for, I've been in the political sphere because I do have a lot of interest in public policy, et cetera. So I've consulted with the DNC uh, prior to the 2016 and the 2020 elections. And um, currently I'm consulting for NASA on their astrophysics database, which they uh, put together a bunch of DIB specialists to look over their database to make sure it is equitable. And uh, it's a five-year project that we've been putting together. I've also worked in nonprofit where I've come in to sort of write their DIB roadmap. Um, so, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is that whatever it is that you're interested in, that's what you ought to study because it will inform whatever life path you decide to take. You know, um, I think when I was 16, I was pretty convinced I was going to be a physicist. Uh, because I love science and math, then it made sense to me. It's easier, less messy than humans. And then I became an ethnographer, which is <laughs> just ridiculous to think about. Um, but throughout that thread, my interest in social justice, which is guided by my morals, and you know, I don't think of myself as a religious person in the sense of like um, being part of a faith. I grew up a religious. Uh, not really religious, but conscientious as a Muslim person because of world events and politics and how I was perceived, right? Like to grow up in a police state uh, such as was New York City for brown people and immigrant people post 9-11, you couldn't not have that consciousness. And that informed a lot of the things that I went on to then do, um, such as be part of Occupy as it took off. And then to be part of, you know, um, Black Lives Matter. I went to Missouri in the summer of 2014 after Mike Brown was uh, murdered. And so these are things that I have been involved in that are very much informed by both my professional and personal ideas of how I ought to be human in this world. And I think that's what HDS does. It really um, helps bolster whatever it is that he makes you human. And we're all human in our own unique way. So, you know, um, 
Like, yes, it's a big decision. What do you want to study in grad school? But also it's not. Choose what feels right to you. So, you know, you know, um, I, I think of Michael Jackson very fondly and very often and we're still in touch. And he really gave me the roadmap for how I came to think of myself as an ethnographer of the human condition. I joke about that. And uh, but I am that's and that informs all of my social justice work informs my work with uh, the city of Philadelphia. I'm involved in a lot of different things with the mayor's office, etc. It informs what I do professionally. So yeah, uh, that was a little long winded. So but <laughs> Finally, uh, Ferris. Yeah, I hope folks are saying there's a wide variety of things that you can do. I just want to put a plug in for while you're at HDS. Um, I think it's required for the MDiv program, but get involved in some kind of field education experience, right? Outside the classroom, boots on the ground in communities, right? That's what really shaped. And even if it's not required as part of your program, I think getting into a community outside of the academic space at HDS can be truly formative. Um, my first field ed experience was working with a nonprofit. My second was serving as an intern at a local church in Cambridge, a Western Avenue Baptist Church led by HDS alum. And I interned there and I became the executive pastor there the year after that. And that just shaped so much of like my life trajectory. It, it brought to bear my HDS classroom experiences with people I was serving in the community with, and more than likely many of us are going to be around people who didn't never sat in an ACS classroom. So I think being in a community with people, it really helps like give texture and shape and like realize, okay, like we've talked about this in the classroom, but why does it matter for people who may never sit in these spaces who are dealing with some of the things that I'm just talking about in theory, right? So that experience shaped my, my call to pastoring and the pastorate. It led me to really cultivate a deeper academic interest in the future of black church spaces where I went to do my PhD in practical theology across the river, Boston University School of Theology. Um, it led me to be interested in chaplaincy. So I also did a unit of CPE at a cancer hospital in Houston. So all that being said, I just really think it's important. The classroom is great, but the more you can get plugged in amongst people outside the academy, it will give texture and shape and meaning to what you do in ways that I don't think the classroom can fully provide, right? As you deal with people who are trying to process these very things that we're talking about. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists for this, your all your answers, the fantastic um, information about your experiences and stories. I know the audience must be so incredibly um, supported and feel really encouraged by you all. So um, I'm going to just get started with some Q&A. Um, and I'm going to ask if folks can jump in uh, if, if this uh, makes sense. So one, uh, one is several members of the panel have mentioned the role of their queer identities in their decision to attend HDS. What were your experiences, queer people of faith at HDS and in your post HDS lives? <clears throat> Would someone like to start? Gary? Sure, I'll jump in. I, you know, part of the process also for me that we didn't really talk about was I also had to decide where I wanted to minister in terms of what movement I wanted to be aligned with. Um, I, I think in some ways I'm a closet Anglican. I love all the smells and bells and uh, the congregational tradition doesn't do any of that stuff. So I, I get no smells and bells. I have to go visit people on vacation days to get that part of uh, life. But I, but I was very blessed to find the United Church of Christ, to join Judson Memorial Church uh, when I was living in New York City. So that um, certainly was a tremendous help um, in finding that. It, being queer was a, it, it just was a non-issue um, at HDS when I was there, quite frankly. Um, a significant number of classmates, um, some who um, made steps on their journey to self-identification while at HDS. Uh, so some some folks weren't queer when they got there and left queer. Uh, but not not that any conversion was going on or anything, but you know, just the the self-acceptance. Um, Cambridge, the Boston area is a wonderful uh, place. Uh, folks who are um, having that experience. Yeah, so, and and since graduating from Divinity School, I, I would have, uh, I would not take a call that was not what we call in our denomination an open and affirming church. 
Uh, but I'm not going to say it's always been easy. Um, sometimes helping a church understand its role as a prophetic church requires some work. Um, being prophetic is scary sometimes. Um, the church I'm in was founded by crazy abolitionists uh, in 1846 and has never lost that vibe. So uh, embracing the queer community is just part of who we are. So hopefully I answered the question from my part of the story. Yes, and I, I, what I can say is that that uh, HDS was definitely a very welcoming, warm, uh, safe space, but it's also a space that provides opportunity to be, to, to have as a brave space and to continue to accept and to also give back. Um, and I, I'll say this, that uh, in HDS, we did um, uh, Dia de los Muertos and a Halloween altar we had. Harvey Milk on it. We had Selena Quintanilla. We had um, Pancho Villa next to, well, Marilyn Monroe wasn't really queer, but we put her up here on the Dia de los Muertos altar anyways. But it was a space that that allowed for growth. You know, I, I it was very warm and caring also among my Latino alumni throughout the university, not just at HDS, but my HDS graduate students were also very affirming, very uh, warm. I presented several projects that I worked for classes for Harvey Cox. And I, I introduced womanist, feminist, queer um, theologies and identities in there, uh, working together with my African-American brothers and sisters as well. Uh, it, it, it was a, a definitely a great vehicle for coming out and for also um, bringing everyone along in this journey. Uh, to this day, I still, oh, I forgot to mention that I, I I also ran for public office. I ran an election, I won, I ran an election, and I lost. After that, I was appointed. And creating that PAC, um, I was one of the first Latino um, openly LGBT school board members to run many, you know, in, um, almost in the last century, at the beginning of this century, right? But it it, it really, uh, uh, the, 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 what we learned about social justice in Sunday school, we applied it in divinity school and we took it out into the community and and uh, it, it's it's been a phenomenal experience. Uh, so it, it's definitely a warm, welcoming space, but it's also a space to be brave. My goodness, thank you both so much. And thank you to all of our alumni panelists um, for your time, your voices and stories. Um, I hate to cut this conversation short because I think we can keep on going, but uh, we do have another event. Thank you all so much for joining us. We are so grateful to you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful week. Bye-bye.